The vast expanse of Nevada's badlands stretches endlessly to the horizon. Hidden within these mountain strongholds are some of America's deepest and darkest secrets. Secret aircraft and the other legends of Area 51. Among these sandstone canyons today, there's a new glimmer of truth. Shrouded in mystery, it's a story that demands to be told. These are the witnesses of one of America's most unusual UFO encounters in history. Navy veterans and a band of brothers that want you to know that what they witnessed is real. This is their story. Petty Officer Jason Turner served aboard the USS Princeton in 2004. His personal conviction for democracy and patriotism guides him in his search for the truth. This is an actual event that happened and I witnessed it. Aviation tech Patrick Hughes, a USS Nimitz veteran, he speaks for his shipmates who choose to remain silent. I, I'm one of those who has to see to believe. Um, and obviously I've seen the evidence of this, so it exists. Top Gun Air Intercept Controller Kevin Day and Fire Controlman Gary Voorhees, both from the Princeton, served together in the ship's Combat Information Center. They saw them first, whatever it is they are. They wanted to show themselves whatever they were. I don't think they wanted anything really to do with us. They were literally breaking the laws of physics in my eyes. These sailors are here for truth and vindication, and their story goes back over a decade to a time and place that marked a departure for all of them, both in their Navy careers, but also in their knowledge of the limits of man's technological understanding of our world. Looking out over the ocean toward the horizon, sun, sea, and sky form an endless vista, a never-ending cycle of tide, wind, and waves. Here, far from shore, strange events have unfolded. These stories stretch the boundaries of our imagination and challenge our beliefs. This is a true story of such events from the accounts of the sailors and naval aviators who experienced them. Professional military service members who want the world to know that what they encountered is real. Even more troubling, our military has no explanation. The answers seem to elude everyone, like reflections on the waves. Yet, they are out there. November 10th, 2004. 90 miles southwest of San Diego, California, in the Naval Operations Area, the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group and her complement of warships and the aircraft of Air Wing 11 are conducting a routine two-week training exercise. Nearby, the guided missile cruiser USS Princeton has been tracking unknown aircraft that appear and disappear from her sophisticated Aegis radar screens. The Spy-1 Bravo radar is one of the most advanced sensors ever deployed. Princeton's main role is air defense of the strike group, and Operation Specialist Senior Chief Day is in charge of protecting the airspace around the Nimitz. And my job was to man the radars and ID everything that flew in the skies. And I also um, sat a position called Anti-Air Warfare Coordinator, where if we ever had to go to war, I was the guy that was gonna launch the missiles and kill shit. Um, in addition to that, I was an air intercept controller. When the Super Hornets take off the carrier, I'm the guy that takes control and takes them to the fight and gets them home safe. And there was a lot of experience in that room. The captain had 28 years, I had 18 years. And the Aegis ship is um, our newest uh, weapon system afloat. It's got the Spy-1 radar system, uh, phased array radar system, and I was an, an expert on that. Inside the Combat Information Center, 
Chief Day's attention is focused on a group of unknown aircraft on the Spy One screen. He's trying to identify them. I was on watch and we were probably 100 miles, I forget how far exactly that day we were, off the coast of San Diego Southwest, um, kind of off the coast of Mexico Baja. And I started to notice um, these weird tracks that were popping under my radar, radar coverage right around San Camilete Island. And the reason why I say they were weird because they were appearing in groups of five to 10 at a time. And they were pretty closely spaced to each other. And they were 28,000 feet going 100 knots tracking south. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, that's kind of odd. I mean, what? I don't know anything that flies like that. They weren't on the Com Air routes, the commercial air airline routes. Um, I wasn't really that concerned about them. I didn't consider them hostile for any, any reason at all. Another watch or two, as I'm watching the same formation appeared again. And over the course of uh, three, four days, it probably counted up to that point, um, groups of five to 10 at a time. There were probably 50, 60 tracks by then. Today, Kevin and Gary are still looking for answers. They've known each other for over a decade since their Navy days. Gary was a third-class petty officer and fire controlman back then. I worked on the Aegis computer system uh, on a CG-59 uh, guided missile cruiser, the USS Princeton. I'm in charge of uh, CC and uh, data recording and maintaining and operating all the mainframes that run the system. They're both becoming increasingly frustrated in their attempts to ID the strange aerial objects, which have no transponders and fit no known flight profiles. The guys that work on the Spy One Bravo radar, they, they had come across and said they needed to take the system down for recalibration because they were getting uh, clutter uh, or ghost tracks and they needed to recalibrate to get rid of them. Then once they did finish all that recalibration, bring it back up, uh, the tracks didn't disappear. Uh, they were still there, but they were actually sharper and clearer. They were doing a diagnostic tests on everything we had to make sure it was not a system malfunction. And it turned out that it wasn't. These were actually real objects. Um, I had the, spy, the highest spy track quality possible on these, co on these contacts. In this situation, I actually started recording on all four tapes at the same time. That way, it was a one continuous loop, and I was just replacing them as they were you know, becoming full. We failed utterly to identify these things. It, it, it didn't um, meet any of the parameters for anything that was known. In some cases, they seem to descend from space and then suddenly plunge to near sea level in seconds. Coupled with the unidentified nature of the craft and lack of clearance, these extreme flight observations are very troubling to the crew assigned to protect the carrier group from aerial threats. Sunday, November 14th, morning. The Nimitz deck crew is busy launching F-A-18F Super Hornets, helicopters, and E-2 Hawkeye early warning planes. The mission? Simulated air defense or ADAX training over the Pacific. The winds are calm, the skies are clear, a near perfect day for flying. As they launch, the Black Aces Squadron has no knowledge of events happening nearby. In the back of my mind, that's when I determined I was going to become concerned about these objects is we were getting ready to launch a whole bunch of aircraft in that same piece of sky. Fast Eagle climbs out to 20,000 feet and heads to the cap station about 40 miles south of the carrier. The cap is a rendezvous point used to form up with the other airplanes. Just 25 miles separation. The commander of Fast Eagle has over a decade in the air wing. His wingman for the day is a new pilot, a young officer on her first carrier deployment. She's paired with a senior pilot, her backseat weapons system officer for the mission. He will manage navigation and the advanced radar and targeting pods on the aircraft. Overhead, an E-2 Hawkeye from the Wall Banger Squadron is on station directing the aircraft. Banger provides eye-in-the-sky command and control during carrier flight operations. Back in the Combat Information Center on Princeton, the mysterious objects are back. 
and today is the first time Senior Chief Day has jets in the air that can intercept the mysterious aircraft. Seeing these contacts, um, Captain Smith orders me to intercept one of them, so I just, I, I went back to the console, I picked the closest one that was to us, and I was gonna, I was, had intended to let the Hawkeye do the intercept, because I already had control, it was just easier. Day briefs the captain, and they agree to send the Hornets. The air intercept controller aboard Princeton, call sign Charlie, radios the Hawkeye and takes control of Fast Eagle. Banger, Charlie. Charlie, so Banger, go ahead. Banger, Charlie, do you hold unknown air contact? Bra 27048, 28,000 feet, bogey. Charlie Banger, negative. Radar picture's clean. The E-2 radar operators have been frustrated in their attempts to get a radar return on the unknown aerial target that Princeton is tracking. Even with their 24-foot radar dish, they can't get a lock on the object. Banger, Charlie. Transfer fast eagle flight to Charlie Control. Button 1-3. We have a real-world tasking for them. Charlie, Banger, Roger. Test Eagle, Charlie, stand by for real world tasking. Charlie, Fast Eagle, send it. We vector him towards that position in the sky and real quiet on the radio. We're, I'm just giving him um, bra calls, which is bearing range altitude, to these unknown bogey group. And basically, I'm just telling the, their crew where the object is, the, the bearing from them, and the range from them, and the altitude so they can drive towards it. Contact bra 27041. 20,000 feet, bogey, snap, 270, over. Roger, bearing 270, 41 miles. 100, go trail. 100, say state. State 12,000 pounds. Clean, do you have it? I'm trying to get a track on it now. They sent link 16. My radar picture is clean. The next radio call takes everyone by surprise. Fast Eagle 110, say loadout. 110, what's your weapons loadout? Yeah, the tactical action officer, the TAO, um, jumps on the radio. Her name was Lieutenant Elders, and she just point blank asked the Fast Eagle flight if they were carrying any type of weapons. And fast, there was a stunned pause on the radio. Wings clean, Princeton. We just have CAD-M training missiles, and they're not coming off the rail. We're in an exercise environment, and the last thing we wanted to do is start shooting stuff. Now the controllers have the pilots' undivided attention. Normally, the squadron doesn't carry live ordnance when training. What do you guys think that was about? What, about the loadout? I have no idea. Maybe it's drug runners or something. Yeah, it could be. Or a lost session out of SoCal. I don't like this. Fast Eagle Charlie. Contact Bra 16034. 8,000 feet. Love you. Roger. 34 miles at 8,000. Committed. Your call. Continuing. As Fast Eagle approaches the target, they see nothing unusual. Their onboard radars can't get a lock on the object. Fast Eagle Charlie Bra 16010, 8,000 feet. Roger. Fast Eagle Charlie, merge plot. Basically, what the merge plot means on the radar. You got two objects in the same vertical piece of sky, so when I'm looking at the 2D display, it looks like a one, one radar blob now. From the object appears stationary. I had it at 17.7. Showing, I get basically no airspeed on it. Hey, you guys seeing us? What is that? As the Super Hornets approach the target, they see a disturbance on the ocean surface. It's about the size of a 737, and it looks like something could be just below the surface. 100, anchor here, 
we're observing something in the water here, possibly aircraft in the water at the merge plot, just north of our position, about two miles. Charlie, roger. I'm descending to Angels 14 to take a look. Do you think that's our unknown? Man, eh, not sure. Radar is clean. As soon as he got to the merge plot position, the object that he was intercepting dropped from 28,000 feet down to 50 feet above the water in 0.78 seconds, as I found out later the next day. As the Super Hornets get closer to the ocean disturbance, he suddenly spots another craft above it, a much smaller white object with an oblong shape, hovering, then darting just above the waves. The object is moving around erratically, seemingly focused on the white water. The shape is similar to a tic-tac. It's smooth like porcelain. It's not an airplane. Suddenly the object begins to rise into the air. The strange craft begins mirroring the turn rate of Fast Eagle. The object is now at his three o'clock position as he continues to turn with it. He's turning hard at 3,000 meters. We had the external communications in the speaker in combat so everyone could listen to it. And the next thing I hear in the radio going, oh my God, oh my God, I'm engaged, I'm engaged. 1,000 meters, he's fast enough. The commander is now about a mile away as he maneuvers his Hornet to get behind the unknown craft. It's about the size of an F-18, about 47 feet long, and it has no wings. As the dogfight unfolds, he quickly turns and dives to bring his jet's nose ahead of the object to close the distance. Suddenly, the tic-tac rockets pass. It's gone beyond the horizon in the blink of an eye. I saw it go 137. No tally. That didn't just happen. Say again. Fast Eagle Charlie, sir, you're not going to believe this, but the bogey group is now back at your cap station. Over As Fast Eagle returns to the area of the ocean disturbance, the object is gone and the sea is once again calm. Soon, they land on the ship. Back on board Banger, the flight crew has been listening to the radio transmissions from Fast Eagle. The crew has been tracking the intercepts on their advanced display systems called the CEC. One of the radar operators who wishes to remain anonymous describes hearing the fear in the pilot's voices, and he knows this is no drill. Uh, I had a good friend who, who flew on the Hawkeyes. We've been calling him Roger uh, to protect his identity because uh, he didn't want to come forward at this time, but he wanted to contribute to the story to verify that it actually happened. So there are five people in the airplane. Um, Roger would have been seating in the, the radar officer seat, which is towards the back middle of the plane, to the side of each one of them, or behind them, depending how the chair is rotating, is a window. Suddenly, his attention is drawn to something outside the Hawkeye. He and the entire crew watch in disbelief as a tic-tac object suddenly forms up on their E-2, and then just as quickly shoots away from sight. The crew is left in disbelief. As Banger returns to the ship, the crew is shaken. 
The highly unusual events are troubling, but what happens next has haunted them to this day. U.S. Navy officers quickly arrive and escort the air crew to a secure space on the ship. As the crewmen begin to take off their flight gear, an officer begins the debriefing by telling them this event did not happen. And they are given non-disclosure agreements to sign. They are warned to never discuss this event again. Again, we're preparing for the air defense exercise. Now we got all the squadrons launching off the carrier because they're all up going to do their functional check flights. Senior Chief Day watched in disbelief as the Tic Tac UFOs reacted to the incoming fighter jets. All the objects in the sky, they all dropped out of the sky from 28,000 feet down to 50 feet. Based on the SPY-1 Bravo radar system, the object descended at over 24,000 miles an hour. It was unbelievable because normally what would happen if, that, if a normal aircraft did that, first of all, it would fly apart. It wouldn't be able to withstand the G-forces and there would be multiple sonic booms. It would be boom, 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 and this did not make any sonic booms. From what I observed, uh, I, I saw that it went from, you know, right around between 25 and 30,000 feet down to sea level and below sea level. Contact, tag number 042. Below sea tag. level uh, was confirmed to me by the actual the sonar Bow. techs that were in combat, uh, in communications with other techs uh, that had said they had an active track on it under the water. They're talking with their sonar guys on the sub that was with us, uh, you know. And I mean, I mean, I was told directly that it did go underwater. You know, I mean, it went from being in the air to underwater. Well, from what they were saying, they were, it was going averaging about 500 knots under the water. You know, so it did slow down when it hit the water, but it didn't affect it inertially. After the intercepts, both Kevin and Gary climbed up to the ship's bridge wing to get a better view of the objects through the binoculars. We'd go up to the bridge wing and look, look at them through the big eyes, which is uh, heavily magnified binoculars that are out on the bridge wing of the ship. Even when I was off watch, I was usually up in combat anyway, and I was sitting at the console, I just picked the closest object to us, and I got the relative bearing um, from the ship, slave over to the relative bearing of about the right altitude, and saw this white light in the sky. The movements were uh, smooth to erratic. Yeah, they just moved from one point to another. It was always a very sharp and clean uh, movement. It always felt like a constant speed, not like speeding up, just it needed to go to that point and it decided to do it at this speed. And then it would just go from nothing to the speed they were gonna go and then stop at the next point. Meanwhile, back on the Nimitz, aviation tech Patrick Hughes is working to secure the classified data recorders from the Hawkeye that encountered the Tic Tac. We pull out the, uh, the hard drives, we call them RMCs, we call them bricks because they're physically heavy like a brick. Um, but they contain the software to run the airplane and they also record a lot of the data that the uh, air crew sees during the flight. So we take the, the removable stuff, we take it out, we go downstairs, back to our shop. Patrick's job involves tracking the chain of custody of the hard drives. Uh, then we open up the safe, put them in the safe. We've got tracking sheets so we know what, what RMCs are on what airplane. Uh, we know who signed them out, who put them in the airplane, who took them out of the airplane. As he gets ready to wrap up the mission, there's a knock on the door. Our commanding officers there, uh, two other uh, guys in flight suits who I'm assuming were Air Force officers because I'm pretty sure that's the insignia they had on but they were not on the ship earlier. I did not see them come on the ship, so I'm not sure how they got there. Um, but the, the skipper basically said, I need the bricks off the flight. We, we opened the safe, we put them in the bags. He took them, he took his two anonymous officers and left. The officers, with the classified hard drives in hand, soon board an HS-60 Seahawk helicopter and leave Nimitz.
Soon thereafter, Petty Officer Voorhees has his own visit by unknown officials on the Princeton. Once they landed and everybody got off, got off, uh, then about you know maybe 20 minutes later, I got called in to have all my data recording tapes turned over, and then uh, also told that I needed to reload CEC because it had been wiped. So it was. Uh, and so I, I turned over all the tapes, and then they also said if there's any even blank tapes to erase anything else that's in the shop. Well, they were plainclothes people that came aboard on the helicopter. Um, it was my chain of command that took, that took control of the tapes from me. The helo left with them after that, So because we went right back to flight ops. The link between the Tic Tacs and these men is unknown. How they became aware of the UFO encounters and how they arrived so quickly on board after the event is also a mystery. The video you are now watching is the actual gun camera FLIR footage of the Tic Tac taken by a later flight. This is the first video ever released by the U.S. government showing military planes engaging UFOs. The advanced targeting pod, known as ATFLIR, works in both TV mode and infrared mode. The film reveals no control services, no exhaust plume, a uniform heat signature, and no visible means of propulsion. Gary and his shipmates saw the FLIR film on their consoles and on the secret LAN aboard the Princeton. It was a much clearer video. You could see the shape of the ship. You could see it, you know, moving. You know, I tried to go and get a disc to come make a copy of it, and by the time I got back, it was already off of our hard drive, uh, off the secret LAN. Yeah, no access to it whatsoever. Petty Officer Jason Turner also saw a much higher resolution version of the FLIR film showing strange appendages extending from the object. But it did have some protruding at the bottom of it. I couldn't tell if they were curled back or straight down. Jason says the video was approximately 10 minutes in length and much longer than the video that has been released. I saw this video playing and I'd ask him, is this what we're training or was part of this training that we're going through and he said no this is real life and um, when I saw it it was a very clear image a very clear video and this thing was going berserk like making turns like it's incredible the amount of g-forces that it would put on a human that this thing was was doing the the jets were like trying to trail this thing and it would just run off and leave them. It would just poof, gone and then it would come back and then you would see it and then it, I mean it was, it made a, a maneuver like they were chasing it straight on. It was going with them. This thing stopped, turned and just poof, gone. I mean it, that's the only way to describe what it looked like. Dude, this is a fucking drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my God. Just 11 years later, fighter jets from USS Roosevelt filmed this anomalous object in 2015. Well, if there's like this thing, it's rotating. Like the Nimitz encounter, they too were conducting routine training when fleets of UFOs were encountered by the pilots. The Nimitz encounters remained cloaked secrecy for over 13 years. The first-hand testimony about UFO sightings is practically unheard of from military service members. Thanks to the brave and honest accounts of the sailors and naval aviators who have come forward to relate their experiences, and of the remarkable videos they filmed that day, the silence has been broken. I dealt with this all on my own for many, many years, um, and it was not a very pleasant journey to go through, because um, no one really believes you. But now, things have changed, and anyone out there that's struggling with this and wants to reach out, there is now a group that you can reach out to and get help and uh, support and vindication. It's honestly been a little relieving to be able to actually talk about it and how important that event really was and uh, not just keep blowing it off. Um, there's people out here that you know really need to know and want to know and you have the support of you know me and Kevin and the other my other shipmates that have come forward and decided to talk about it. My role is to uh, 
describe the story and convince people that yes, this event really happened and these objects were really real, but what they are, I have no idea. It is something, I wanna know what it is. Um, that's the whole reason I chose to come forward to contribute to the story, because there is a story here, there is more information here. Uh, and the more of us that talk about it, the, the better chance of the full story coming together. And, and it's almost, it's vindication for us that other people are looking into it and you know, it, we finally tell our story and people listen. Uh, if you need to get a hold of us uh, or would like to talk to any of us, Kevin, me, or any of the other guys that have come forward, uh, there'll be an email address at the end of this video that you can contact them and they can get a hold of us. If you or someone you know has witnessed unknown objects from military ships or planes, please contact us at the address on your screen. You can remain anonymous. As we strive to understand these encounters and come to terms with what they mean, there's something far beyond the horizon and the limits of our comprehension waiting. Waiting for all of us.